Well, good evening, everyone. My name's Robin Archer, and I'm the director of the Ralph Miliband Program here at the London School of Economics. Now, I'd like to welcome you all to the latest in our series of lectures and panels on the theme reconstruction. Um, the idea behind the panel was to try to explore the impact of the um, sustained problems that have arisen from the coronavirus crisis and in particular, the impact as it bears on opportunities and dangers for progressives and progressive politics. And tonight we wanted to focus on a particular theme on the theme of the position of key workers. Now, as everyone's aware, key workers involve a range of different people, including medical professionals, but also large numbers of delivery drivers, supermarket workers and others. And the question we wanted to consider tonight was whether in the context of the coronavirus crisis, the long trend towards greater inequality in the income and status of these kinds of workers might have some potential to be reversed. And to do that, we've got an absolutely first rate panel and it couldn't be better. And I want to just briefly introduce them to you. So um, Kate Bell is the head of the Economic and Social Affairs Department at the British Trades Union Congress, the TUC. And her department has overall responsibility for strengthening employment rights, for promoting um, worker friendly social and economic policy, and also for promoting international solidarity. She was previously the head of policy at a local authority. She has advised the Labour Party, including its leader during the time of uh, Ed Miliband on questions of work and pensions. And she coordinated campaigns for the Child Poverty Action Group. She's presently also a commissioner on the Low Pay Commission, and she's the author of numerous reports on social and economic policy, and I won't start to list them all um, today. Our other speaker is Deborah Hargreaves. She's the chair of the London Child Poverty Alliance and the founder, as well as one of the directors of an independent think tank, the High Pay Centre, which seeks to monitor executive pay. She previously worked at the Financial Times, and if you remember some time ago, um, her, she had very incisive articles there that were sort of must reads for anybody. And she also worked at The Guardian, where she was the business editor. She's too published a series of reports, but I particularly want to mention her widely reviewed recent book, Are Chief Executives Overpaid? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna hear from our two speakers first, um, Deborah Hargreaves, then Kate Bill, one after the other. Um, they're gonna each speak for about 20 minutes or so. And then we're gonna have plenty of time for questions and discussion. I might start by giving them each a question and then we wanna we want hear from you. Um, do please write in with your questions, who you are and where you're from. It makes it nicer for the audience that's spread all around um, the country and all around the world. Before I call on my speakers though, um, it's difficult because we can't all clap, but. Let me, on behalf of the LSE, on behalf of the audience, and on behalf of myself, um, welcome both our speakers tonight, Deborah Hargreaves and Kate Bell. Thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to you, Deborah. Hi. Um, well, thanks, Robin. Thanks for that introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, incomes and uh, an income inequality. And, um, and then Kate will talk about rights and, uh, and everything else associated with uh, inequality. So just to bring one fact um, to mind um, for you, um, before the end of the first week of January, most of our top bosses will have taken home more money than you and I will earn in the whole year. In fact, than most people will earn in the whole year. And that's really a very um, short time, 34 hours this year. So by um, the end of um, the 6th of January, they'd already um, racked up enough to um, keep the rest of us um, going for the rest of the year. So um, this, is, this is a, um, a piece of data that uh, might take a, a little bit of sinking in. It's something that the High Pay Centre calculates each year. And it's a very, very rough measure of inequality, but it does show how um, rising pay at the top has opened up this huge gulf between people in the middle and at the bottom. And um, we've seen the ratios um, rise very swiftly. Um, in the UK, we have about 120 times um, 
between um, average top pay um, and, uh, and medium pay. Um, and that's risen quite uh, sharply um, in the past 20 years. Uh, we often get told um, during the COVID crisis that we have uh, world beating systems in the UK. Um, one thing we can certainly be sure of is that we are world beating on income inequality. We are actually ninth um, out of the um, 40 countries in the OECD um, for being the most unequal. We're not as bad as the US where income inequality is huge, um, but we are worse than most of our um, our near neighbours in Europe. And it's really only emerging economies like South Africa, Turkey, um, that, uh, that do worse than us on, on inequality. So this all was um, happening before the COVID crisis. I mean, we'd had, certainly since the end of the financial crisis, we'd had 10 years of um, suppressed incomes for most people. Um, let's not forget that average wages have not really recovered to the level that they were at um, in 2008 and um, have certainly not kept up um, with, uh, with the cost of living. And now, of course, um, COVID um, has only made that worse. Um, we are now facing the worst recession that we're likely to see for 300 years. And, uh, and, they, and people um, at the bottom of the income scale, many of whom are key workers, will be um, struggling to make ends meet. People who are actually um, paid um, fairly well will have saved quite a lot of money during the crisis because they will have saved money on going out to restaurants, going on holiday, that sort of thing. But we found um, that people who um, were already on low incomes and already struggling um, will be paying more for heating, more for eating, um, because they're, they're at home more. And that's just um, led um, to, to more difficulties for people at the bottom. Um, and a lot of the strategies that low income families would use to get by have not been available um, during lockdown for charity shops are closed, um, hard to get round to relatives if, um, if you're going round for, for dinner, that sort of thing. Uh, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation last week um, brought out its flagship report on poverty and pointed out that those um, on the minimum wage, um, four in 10 workers, um, face a high risk of losing their job compared to only 1% on those earning more than £40,000. So it is, it is very precarious. Um, the, those jobs in hospitality, retail, and the care sector, often very poorly paid before the pandemic, and many of them have, have disappeared. Um, austerity, of course, um, has seen um, benefits um, suppressed as well as incomes. Um, the government um, did in introduce this 20 pounds a week extra on universal credit um, during the pandemic, but that's due to run out in March. And there's now quite a lot of calls for that to be extended, but uh, it will take some time before the um, economy gets back on its feet again. So, um, we call them key workers and we all clapped for them um, back in the first lockdown, um, but we seem to be very resistant to giving them a pay rise. People on, um, in, in, in the NHS, in care, doctors, nurses, um, retail workers particularly. Um, in our supermarkets, um, the retail workers are generally um, not paid the living wage. Um, that's um, £9.50 an hour outside London. Uh, Ten pounds eighty-five inside London, and that's people at uh, Tesco, Sainsbury's, and Morrison's. Those sort of um, those sort of shops. Morrison's has recently said it would um, boost its pay for all employees from April to ten pounds an hour, which is a step forward. Um, the chief executive David Potts said that Morrison's colleagues had earned their status as key workers and they'd earned this pay rise many times over, not forgetting, of course, that he took home 4.2 million pounds last year, and Morrison's has a ratio between top and average pay of 217, which is the sixth highest in the UK. 
So um, we at the High Pay Centre have been analysing um, pay ratios. Um, last year was the first time that um, most private companies had to release this kind of data in their annual reports. They had to release quite a lot of additional data about um, the ratio between the top um, and average pay and ratios within the pay um, scale at those companies. And it does paint quite an interesting picture, particularly um, for those on low pay. The um, top 10 um, pay ratios um, out of the top 10, six of those companies uh, were in retail, um, big retail groups. Ocado was at the top because the, um, the boss there had got huge um, multi-million pound payouts over 50 million last year. Um, but it does, it does show um, huge gaps. Um, we don't know the ratios in the public sector in so much detail. Um, they would be lower, of course, but still um, there are, um, there are some, top, some big salaries in the public sector, not as big as the private sector, but there, there are big gaps there too. And this is the result of choices. Um, we don't have to, we don't have, to um, have inequality. It's not an in inevitable outcome of, of our um, economic setup. It's a choice that we've made. Um, we have a, really created a, a winner takes all economy in the past 20 years with um, a lot of the rewards rising to the top and uh, the um, general um, workforce wages being shrunk and suppressed. And we've also um, shrunk the safety net. We've made things much more difficult um, for the low paid. Many people, we've been resistant to tax rises um, to allow more redistribution of income. And we've also removed many of the protections traditionally associated with the job. So um, lots of um, the people that we would call key workers during the pandemic, we must remember that they are often on um, very precarious contracts, short-term contracts, no guaranteed hours, uh, very um, insecure jobs, and a lot of the risks of employment have been shifted onto the, um, onto the employee and away from the employer. So I really think we need to think about how we share out the proceeds of wealth as we come out of the COVID crisis. We really need to put pressure on companies and on government to try and make some changes and to try and um, uh, move towards a fairer income distribution. Um, the high pay centre has long lobbied for more of an employee voice in um, pay decision making. Uh, that would um, mean um, workers on company boards and among pay bodies, on remuneration committees, and uh, even um, workforce votes on, um, on pay awards. Um, it, um, we can create a um, much more buoyant economy if we spread income more fairly. We can create much more spending within the economy, a better start for children, and more social cohesion. The, um, pay ratio data that I already mentioned is a very interesting insight into the way companies structure their pay scales. And uh, it's quite hard to insist on a mandated pay ratio. Um, this, was, this was mooted by Jeremy Corbyn during the um, 2017 um, election campaign where he spoke about a 20 to one ratio. Um, that would be a big ask for most organizations, even in the public sector. But you can use ratios um, in creative ways. Um, one company that has done that, um, which is um, the John Lewis Partnership, of course, owned by its employees, um, owns John Lewis and Waitrose. And they have um, a mandate there that um, no person can earn more than 75 times um, median wages. So Sharon White, the chief exec, gets around a million pounds a year, which might sound like a lot, but um, is much less than, as, as we remember, Dave Potts at Morrison's gets uh, over four million, and uh, and the average in the FTSE 100 the, of big companies in the UK is uh, is is three three and a half million. So it's um, so it's a way of tackling. Um, inequality within companies. Um, it's not an exact science and it does need to be treated a bit carefully because 
already um, outsource workers are not included in ratio data and uh, the imposition of a punitive ratio could encourage um, more outsourcing where paying conditions would be worse. But, um, but it, is an, it is a way to start looking at, um, at data and looking at pay um, in a bit, a bit more forensically. And uh, we would argue that that, um, is, is, that is, is something that would make um, a useful addition to the debate. I just think we can't afford to go back to um, rising levels of inequality. We're a rich country. We shouldn't have people in work um, or even people out of work forced to use food banks and to be bringing up children in, um, in poverty. Um, we can do a lot better and we really should push for a fairer distribution. We can all do, do that. And we need to put pressure on the government to create more secure, better paid jobs and improve employment conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. So we'll just turn now straight to Kate Bell and um, hear what she has to say. Great. Um, well, thanks so much for inviting me today. I'm going to talk about, as the event is built, key workers and inequality, and I'm going to talk about insecurity too. Um, I want to talk about the working conditions that have been exposed for many of the people now dubbed key workers, some of the reasons they still exist and what we can do about them. Um, I want this to be a hopeful talk and one that focuses on the possibility for change. But I was very struck when preparing this, or to be honest, while I was in the kind of procrastination stage of preparing this talk, by reading about the struggles of some key workers a century ago and some of the similarities today. At the moment, there's a nice online exhibition on the TUC website. Um, it's about the Pioneer National Federation of Women Workers and died on the 1st of January, 1921. One of the online captions reads in that exhibition, um, the National Anti-Sweating League of which Mary MacArthur was a leading member campaigned for a minimum wage in order to eradicate the sweated trades. These were characterised by long, very long hours, extremely poor pay and difficult working conditions, which disproportionately affected women. There was some action on these working conditions during World War I, where women were recognised as part of the war effort. But then you get to a later caption, which says, as women's essential war service was readily forgotten, new challenges lay ahead. Federation organisers worked round the clock as many women war workers were laid off. Focus shifted once again to organising amongst women who had no choice but to take low paid work, including domestic service, laundry and food preparation. And you can kind of see where I'm going for with this. Like as I was reading this, this started to seem less like a kind of enjoyable historical piece of procrastination I was doing and more like being reminded of a depressingly familiar fact. The systematic undervaluing of women's work alongside other inequalities underpins the poor working conditions and pay of many of those performing essential work. So things have changed since 1921, but not nearly enough. So to get back to kind of the title, who are key workers? Um, obviously it's a pretty subjective term, but it seems like as good a definition as any to think about those whose work was dubbed vital by the government during a pandemic and vital enough to ask them to continue working at a time when this often meant a real risk to life. We've done some estimations and we think there could are around 9.8 million people who in line with that government guidance of you're a key worker during the pandemic could be classified as a key worker. That's just over a third of all employees. Um, as Robin and Deborah said, they're shop workers, delivery drivers, home carers, nurses, school staff, postal workers and many more. 3.7 million of them, four in 10, earn less than 10 pounds an hour. And that's, you know, linking to what Deborah was saying about that inequality. But low pay doesn't just mean low pay, it brings with it many other issues in the workplace. You're less likely to qualify for sick pay, for example. We know that 2 million people miss out on sick pay because they don't earn enough to qualify, and that those on lower earnings are far less likely to receive additional sick pay from their employer. So a third of those earning less than £15,000 a year, only a third of those receiving earning less than £15,000 a year receive full pay when sick, compared to nearly 90% of those earning over £50,000 a year. 
And very often in the UK, low pay is also accompanied by an extreme insecurity of work. That's both a cause and a consequence of low pay. We estimate that overall in the UK, there's around 3.6 million people in some form of highly insecure work, whether that's zero hours contracts, insecure agency work, or low paid self-employment. And we classify that as low paid employment where you're earning less than the government's minimum wage. It's hard to map those figures directly onto key workers, but we do know that many key worker occupations are characterized by insecurity. Nearly one in six of those in caring, leisure and other service roles are in insecure work. One in five of those in what are called elementary roles when you look at these stats, such as security guards, taxi drivers and shop assistants are also in insecure work. And that compares to just 6% of those in professional roles. And then some of the really high profile key worker roles, we have clearer figures. One in four care workers is on a zero hours contract. And when the shop workers union Usdor surveyed their members, they found that for nearly one in four of their low paid workers, insecure hours were making up a fifth of their wages. As one of their members put it, in my store, you have to check the rotor constantly throughout the week to make sure your shifts haven't been canceled. So you're always worrying about whether you'll be able to get enough hours to make ends meet. When the figures for the number of people on zero hours contracts went over a million this August, it was increases in care work and retail work that were driving that change. And being on a zero hours contract doesn't only mean worrying about getting enough work to make ends meet, it means not being able to plan your life. We polled um, insecure workers and found that half of zero hours workers had had their shifts cancelled at less than a day's notice and nearly three quarters had been offered work, often with penalties for not taking it up in the same time frame. So why have we allowed the workers who we rely on the most to li be living on such unacceptable terms and conditions? I think that answering that question I was asking about who are the key workers helps to explain. First, key workers are much more likely to be women. Women are almost twice as likely as men to be employed in a key worker occupation, 45% of women compared to 26% of men. And many of the largest key worker occupations have a large majority of female employees, care workers, nursery workers, teaching assistants, some of the largest key worker occupations, and that in each of them, over 80% of employees are women, as are 65% of retail assistants. And the long term and systematic undervaluing of women's work is a key part of why key workers are systematically underpaid. I think structural racism is also playing a role here. Black and minority ethnic employees are more likely than white employees to be key workers, with 40% of BME employees being a key worker compared to 35% of white workers. And again, looking at the care sector as a kind of example of this, again, suggests the role of structural discrimination against black workers and the role that's playing in holding down pay. Here, 20% of the workforce is black or minority ethnic compared to 12% of the overall workforce. And nearly 17% of the social care workforce is a non-British national. And of course, gender and race intersect to increase your risk of being trapped in poor working conditions. Looking at whole workforce, one in eight BME women working in the UK are employed in insecure jobs compared to one in 17 white men. So key workers are underpaid, undervalued and an insecure work. And the fact that these workers are disproportionately female and black helps explain this, or at least helps explain why it's been tolerated. But as my Mary MacArthur quote was intended to show, we've known this for a really long time and surely we should know how to address this a hundred years later. I would argue that we do know how to address it, but that the institutions we need to push up back against these inequalities have been systematically undermined. I think to do something about the stark inequalities that have been exposed during the pandemic, we need to rebuild those institutions. And there's three areas I want to talk about. Um, I'm gonna try and not to repeat Deborah too much when I talk about austerity and outsourcing. And I've used the same phrase as she has of saying how these have transferred risk onto workers. I'm gonna talk a bit about regulation and then I'm gonna talk about collective power. So first that transfer of risk onto workers. Austerity has definitely driven that in at least two ways. Um, Deborah talked about how austerity sucked demand out of the economy and employers faced with less demand for their products have pushed that risk, pushed that lack of profits onto workers and we saw the longest pay squeeze for a hundred years. 
Um, we saw a tiny bit of a pushback against that with successive rises in the minimum wage, but I don't think anybody would say that the decade since 2010 had been a good one for workers. Of course, that austerity also had direct impacts on key workers in the public sector. A pay rise followed by pay, what was called pay restraint, for example, left many nurses more than £3,000 worse off today in real terms than they were in 2010. Ambulance drivers, £1,600 worse off a year than they were back in 2010. That austerity squeezed the care sector with the impacts passed on to workers' terms and conditions. And local authority expenditure on adult social care, despite rising demand, was still lower in real terms in 2000. 20, in 2018-19 um, compared to a decade ago, even after some kind of short-term emergency injections of funding. And much of this burden, particularly in the care sector, as Deborah was saying, has fallen on outsourced workers. That's those who were formerly doing public sector roles, but are now in the private sector. Outsourcing, of course, has been another way in which employers have sought to deny responsibility for their workers' terms and conditions. Main driver of outsourcing is, of course, cost reduction. So contracts are often awarded to the lowest cost bid. And the best way to, or the easiest way, certainly not the best way to cut costs is, of course, to cut workers' terms and conditions. And two studies of the care sector in England found that services contracted out to private providers performed worse across pay, zero hours contracts, skill levels, staff retention. And that systematic pushing of risk onto workers has been bad for key workers and bad for inequality. These trends, of course, aren't inevitable. And on this kind of, of my one of my three pillars, I would say there are some grounds for optimism. We've now heard a wide swathe of former cheerleaders for austerity saying that it was the wrong recipe in 2008 and it's the wrong recipe now. We had um, the Financial Times, I think, last week saying that, um, that consensus can be wrong was on display after the 2008 financial crisis when many organisations, including this newspaper, advocated fiscal retrenchment. The facts have changed and economists have changed their minds. Now, economists might have changed their minds. We don't yet know whether politicians have. But I think there is you know, a different climate around now and we have seen some of the impacts of austerity. We've also seen a growing trend for local government to insource services, although no steer from national government to do that. So I think we could see those trends reversed, although it's way too early to say that we're out of the woods yet on both of them. So next kind of institution that, of course, can help to address um, on imbalances of power in the workplace um, is our system of employment law and regulation. Um, that imbalance of power is what leaves many workers unable to say no to jobs on terrible terms and conditions, particularly when there aren't many jobs around. But the last decade again saw a downgrading of many workers' rights. We saw employment tribunal fees introduced from July 20, 2013, meaning an upfront fee to workers who wanted to bring a case against an employer who was denying their rights at work. That meant people having to pay up to £1,200 to enforce their rights. And pretty unsurprisingly, it saw cases coming to employment tribunal falling by over 60%. That ability to charge fees was overturned by a Supreme Court judgment in, 20, in 2017 in a course taken by the trade union, Unison. But I think that introduction of fees had a pretty chilling effect on workers' ability to stand up to their employers and to challenge bad practice. That change has been overturned, but another significant change from that period is still in place. One of the key protections for workers is the Employment Rights Act, which stops them from being sacked or chosen unfairly for redundancy. However, the Tory-led coalition government doubled the qualification period, so that's the time you have to be employed for or before you have rights against um, unfair dismissal, to two years. There are some exceptions, but again, this has been a change with a chilling impact on workers' ability to stand up to their employers and demand better. What are the prospects for re-regulating the labour market? Let's start with the positive. Again, cheerleads for deregulation, for example, the OECD, which is the kind of club of rich nations, which publishes a wide range of kind of advice to governments on what to do with the labour markets, has kind of rode back from its former kind of deregulating self and now says job quality and job quantity can go hand in hand. Um, this Tory government, and of course there have been quite a few Tory governments in the last few years, came into office promising an employment bill that would deliver, and I quote, the largest upgrade to workers' rights in a generation. 
And the trade union movement's long-standing calls to, build, to ban zero hours contracts feel like they're getting a bit more traction. But of course, I don't want to be naive here. Um, you might have seen the front page slash um, splash on the Financial Times on Friday, suggesting that the government was considering scrapping key worker protections like the Working Time Directive, which protects rest breaks for many of the key workers we're talking about, under the guise of exploiting new freedoms after Brexit. We've been heartened by some very swift denials from ministers that this is going to happen. But it's very clear that the case for strengthening workers' protections isn't yet one that's accepted universally, and it's a case that we have to keep on making. So last and probably most importantly, um, and you'd probably expect me to say this from the trade union perspective, is collective power. Um, so let me come back to Mary MacArthur. She recognised that the most effective way for women, then the most vulnerable group in the labour market, to win better working conditions was to organise collectively. Um, I'm going to read you a quote which I like from her. So she said, um, a trade union is like a bundle of sticks. The workers are bound together and have the strength of unity. No employer can do as he likes with them. They have the power of resistance. They can resist reductions in wages. They can ask for an advance without fear. A worker who is not in a union is like a single stick. She can easily be broken or bent to the will of her employer. She has not power to resist a reduction in wages. If she's fine, she must pay without complaint. She dare not ask for a rise. If she does, she'll be told, if you do not like it, you can leave it. An employer can do without one worker. He cannot do without all his workers. If all the workers are united in a union, strong as the bundle of sticks, complain or ask for improved conditions, the employer is bound to listen. So a bundle of sticks probably isn't everyone's go-to metaphor today for thinking about forms of power, but I think the point is really strong. We know that collective power is the best way for the most vulnerable workers to be able to win better terms and conditions. Deborah mentioned Morrison's and that rise to £10 an hour. That was won by us all, that's their trade union. They collectively negotiated that rise and that's how they were able to push pay up. Or we could think about the thousands of pounds in back pay that Unison this year have won for care workers who haven't been paid for their travel time. We know evidence tells us that unions deliver better working conditions and that workplaces with collective bargaining, that is an agreement between the union and the employer that pay and some other conditions will be negotiated collectively. Those workplaces have higher pay, more training days, more what the researchers who carried out this research called equal opportunities practices, better holiday and sick pay provision, more family friendly measures, less long, work, long hours working and pretty importantly right now, better health and safety. But we've seen in the past decade, and in fact the past 40 years, the number of the workers who benefit from these protections being undermined. The proportion of workers who, cover, who are covered by a collective agreement has fallen from over 80% in 1979 to 26% today. Some of this can be explained by industrial change, and we know that unions could have been much quicker to adapt to the kind of decline of the manufacturing, industry and the rise of a service economy. But we've also seen successive waves of anti-trade union legislation, including the Trade Union Act of 2016, which have made it harder for workers to organise, bargain and as a last resort to strike. Again, we have got some room for optimism here. Union membership in the UK has risen for the past three years, but that's after a really long fall. The role of unions in protecting workers has, I would say, been pretty prominent in the pandemic, whether that's been campaigning for the furlough scheme, pushing for stronger health and safety protections, um, or demanding, and in many workplaces, winning better sick pay. And again, international institutions, having recommended for years dismantling trade union structures, have again had a bit of a rethink. The International Monetary Fund in a paper in 2015 showed clearly that declining trade union coverage had been associated with a sharp rise in inequality. And again, the OECD have started to talk about the importance of promoting collective bargaining. And while I'm not always a fan of looking to the US for policy inspiration, I was pretty heartened to see that President-elect Biden's agenda includes a clear commitment to strengthening worker organising, collective bargaining and unions. And his campaign platform states that everything that defines what it means to live a good life and know you can take care of your family, the 40 hour work week, paid leave, healthcare protections, a voice in your workplace is because of workers who organise unions and fought for worker protections. 
So I'm going to leave it there as that last quote, I think, puts it much better than I could. But to summarise, key workers face low pay and insecurity because the institutions that can push back against structural discrimination have been systematically undermined. We know we can rebuild them, but we need to start now. Thank you both very much. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Deborah. I'm just going to start by asking you each one question myself, and then we'll we'll turn to some of the questions that have come um, from the audience. <clears throat> I mean, I, I guess the sort of common point about my questions is to try and turn your attention to the impact of the virus crisis on these problems. And so if I start with you, Deborah, I mean, you set out at some policies that might change, but I wonder in a more sort of political vein, I mean, what are the openings at present to produce some of these changes? I mean, how, if at all, has the virus crisis altered the leverage which proponents of these changes might have, both in businesses and on the government? And I mean, just in brackets, I note that the government, unusually for a conservative government, has some dependence on people who, on constituencies with large numbers of insecure workers. So I, I wonder if you could address that point. How has the COVID crisis affected the leverage that proponents of change might have? Um, yeah, I think that is quite interesting, actually, because we've had that um, so-called um, uh, the, the red wall um, MPs um, who do have quite a different agenda from some of the others in the in the Conservative Party. But I also think um, the um, pandemic has really brought home to people how much they rely on key workers. So we've all been very reliant on delivery drivers, um, supermarket workers, care home workers, the NHS nurses, teachers. Now that parents are having to homeschool their children, they realize quite how difficult this job is. <laughs> and that um, we, we are, we're, we're very, very dependent on key part for, for key parts of the economy, as Kate mentioned, on, on huge numbers of people who are poorly paid. And I think we're now realizing that those jobs are so crucial, we can't um, do without them. So I do think that there's a wider spread, that there's a wider appreciation of the essential role that key workers play and that um, people right across the income scale and people with um, opinion formers and um, uh, politicians now recognize that those um, people who, who maybe have been overlooked for many years um, are pay, playing a key role. And, and we, we want to keep that, we should keep that in the public focus. We shouldn't let that drop off. We should make sure that the, these um, we, we reiterate time and again, how, how important these people are. Um, and, and also through um, examples, um, like Kate mentioned, um, uh, to show how, how hard it is for people to, to make ends meet um, in some of these jobs. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's outrageous that people should be working so hard in, in maybe one or two jobs and still not able to feed their families properly. We, we should be ashamed of that as a rich country. So I think we need to keep this in our sights. And we, um, as, um, as, as uh, policy makers, opinion formers, journalists, we need to keep pressing on this. And hopefully the, um, the, the different focus among some of the Northern MPs, hopefully that will have an impact. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, so Kate, um, in a similar way, I mean, there were so many interesting things you said, and uh, it would be nice to come to some of the points you made at the end, but I wanted to just start with something you said at the beginning, because you put the whole thing in a historical perspective, which I think is always a useful thing to do. And what struck me while you were talking was that we have had huge egalitarian shifts in the past in the wake of big crises, and the classic example is after the Second World War, of course. And there are many arguments about why that happened, but one of them was that the psychology of, of that crisis, of that wartime crisis, for all the differences that people experienced, there was something common about it, that everyone felt some level of existential threat. And on the face of it, the COVID crisis has something of that to it too. So I just wondered if you would reflect on that and wonder, is, is that the sort of thing, not so much, you know, is that the more general psychological effect that might give leverage to proponents of a more egalitarian outcome? Um, I think maybe. Um, I think, you know, like 
all kind of left-wing social policy geeks I am a massive kind of uh you know the formation of the welfare state after world war ii wasn't this amazing and of course the other parallel is that that followed kind of a decade of poverty and austerity in the 30s during which you know much of the case for the welfare state was made and you know now we're in a crisis following a decade of austerity and poverty and you know I think it's really interesting, I'm always going on about the OECD and the IMF changing their mind, but I think the difference is so stark, basically, in terms of how they've said, we got this wrong, you know, this didn't deliver better outcomes. And that intellectual shift had been happening before the pandemic took place. So I think that is why that should give us some kind of, that should give us a reason for optimism, basically. And exactly as Deborah said, you know, things which were maybe hidden before in terms of kind of working conditions, in terms of kind of, as we said, the kind of value we place on people's lives and people's work lives um, have been exposed. But I think there's a couple of things um, that we need to sort of be careful about when thinking about that. So one is um, just how different our experience of work is becoming. So I have not left, you know, my, I'm lucky enough to have a spare bedroom, my spare bedroom for a really long time now. And I go to the supermarket and I see those people's working lives, but it's increasingly different from mine. And I think there's something we need to think really hard about, about how we build that solidarity when our workplaces are so separate. I think the other thing that will be interesting to see is if we are in a situation where we're kind of beyond the crisis, are we all just going to want to forget it? basically, you know, the kind of desire for normality. Um, and, you know, that's why the kind of potency of the kind of build back better slogan is there. But I think one of the things for people campaigning in this area for us, for me to think about is how do we avoid, you know, how do we not make this a kind of, oh, well, you know, clapping was part of the pandemic and we're in a different phase now, you know, the roaring twenties or whatever we're going to have. I guess kind of the last danger I think is, um, uh, unemployment is really bad for social change basically it makes it easier for kind of businesses to argue well we can't afford to give people a pay rise we know that's not true we know that's a false pathology we know higher wages are good but I think we're gonna have to definitely about how we fight that threat as well Okay, well, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to turn now to um, uh, the first question from the audience. This one comes from Jacqueline Maldonado, um, an LSE alumna from Mexico. And uh, I'll read it out. It's, it's a little bit long. I'll direct it in the first instance to Deborah, but, but feel free, Kate, if you want to add. Um, and, and the question is about technology. We've seen, says the questioner, that technology has been a tool for workers around the world to work from home during the pandemic. Um, and naturally, this has not been the case for, for many frontline workers, but has technology at all improved the environment for them? What can institutions like government, particularly in the global south, do to increase the incorporation of technology to improve their working conditions? So in a way, actually following on from what Kate said, but I'll just direct it to Deborah in the first instance. I, I mean, it's obviously there is a gap here, but the question is asking about technology for frontline workers. Um, yeah, well, as Kate says, I mean, we are all working um, quite differently now when um, so many people are working at home. And of course, technology has um, enabled that. But I would argue that technology has actually made um, lo the, the lives of many key workers worse, because if you look at um, the way it's been brought in into, for example, the um, automatic, um, you know, those horrible automatic things that you um, put your shopping through now, um, which means, you know, you don't need um, checkout people anymore. And the apps that are used by Uber and Deliveroo to run the lives of the delivery drivers or the or the drivers. I mean, it's just it's it's made for a very atomized workforce. And this is the problem um, with um, I think, you know, Kate was mentioning about um, unions and collective representation. When you've got such an atomized workforce, which is then driven by apps, where you never really even um, interact with people, you know, say you're a, a delivery driver or you're a taxi driver or whatever, um, that makes it much harder to organize. And it also, that makes it much harder to feel solidarity with your um, fellow workers. And I know we've, we've seen a few improvements in those areas, but 
um, by no means many. Um, so I do think that, you know, we could be heading um, towards, um, uh, you know, technology could be leading us towards a much more, um, a much bigger gap in the workplace between those highly paid people who are benefiting from um, uh, all that technology has to offer and those on low incomes who are kind of controlled by technology through apps or um, see their jobs go to disappear to technology. Uh, so I think, you know, it's kind of, it, it, it can be, it could be, um, it could be a mixed blessing, maybe not a blessing for some. Hmm. Hey, did you want to say something about that or don't feel you have to, but if you would like. <laughs> I would like to say something. Hmm. I think it's a really good question. I mean, like I agree with most of what Deborah said. Um, I think we shouldn't be too gloomy though about the prospects for automation removing jobs. So one of the areas we know we should be growing our workforce is care work. Care work is still extremely difficult to automate basically. And if we were investing properly as a country, we would be investing in the care workforce. We'd be investing in improving their terms and conditions. And we'd be massively investing in increasing the number of people in employment in social care and probably in healthcare and childcare too. So I think there are prospects for kind of job improvement, but we are seeing some really worrying technological trends. We've been doing some work on workplace surveillance and the experience of that. Um, this is sort of anecdote, but I read a terrifying article today on the BBC about a wristband which enables you to tell your boss how you're feeling by pressing a blue or a yellow button, basically. And the idea that, you know, rather than decent paying conditions, health and safety in the workplace, um, employment rights, opportunities to express your voice as a way to improve worker well-being, there will be a button on your wrist to press to tell your boss how you're feeling is quite scary. So I think I think it's not all gloom, but there are some real risks. Um, yes, my son works in the US, just on that anecdote, and he has, um, because you know your healthcare goes with your job in the US, so he has this app which tracks his health, so it, um, it's, it's all about, you know, what, um, how much activity you do, um, how much sleep you get, and all that kind of thing, so the employer, through that app, knows exactly what he's doing in his private life, and that has then an impact on the health insurance, because obviously, <laughs> if he wasn't active enough, he'd get a prompt, you know, because the health insurance would go up. So I kind of find that whole surveillance issue um, to be extremely um, worrying. Mm. Terrifying. Yeah, and clearly the, the, the health requirements that are being linked to these sorts of surveillance surveillance have the potential to expand. I mean, the very idea that you should have a COVID passport, for example, suggests where this might be heading. Um, so the next question comes from Hannah Richmond um, from Leeds, and she wants to ask about productivity. She said, productivity growth seems to be the aim, regardless of the impact on workers or the environment. Should the government and business reassess what economic success looks like? And what new metrics we should be using to measure this in our country? Sorry, I should have said, Deborah, I think I'll just start with you again. Um, yeah, actually, that's a really interesting question. I have a real thing about productivity, actually, because um, we <laughs> that's how we measure economic success. And we measure it through growth, which, of course, um, you know, it, you can't carry on growing exponentially um, in a finite environment. So, I mean, we certainly do need to have... Um, different measures of economic success. We need um, to measure well-being. Um, you know, the New Zealand does this. It's the well-being index. I think we produce one. I think the ONS here, um, Office of National Statistics, actually produces the data, but it's not used in our um, in, in, the, in our economic um, statistics, um, whereas it is actually in New Zealand. Um, we need to look at people, um, you know, it sounds a bit sort of, vague and uh, sort of happiness index well-being I hate well-being as a word anyway but that kind of thing um, but we do need to to find different ways of measuring it um, productivity is 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 a, is terrible for um, within companies um, they are um, bosses pay is often linked to, to performance uh, financial performance measures 
um, like productivity. Um, but it's not very easy for them to um, produce um, improvements in productivity. They tend to have a real eye on the share price. And one way of getting the share price up without um, improving productivity is just by um, keeping wages down for the workforce. So their rewards, the rewards of the bosses are kind of tied to uh, suppressing wages. Um, and um, they, um, there, there is very little investment in um, new technology that might improve productivity. That's, on a, that's within a company basis, but more broadly uh, across the economy, I think we need to get away from um, economic growth as a measure and, and move towards more sustainable measures. That, that just has to be done for environmental reasons, not just um, for um, inequality reasons. Okay, thanks very much. So um, now to you, Kate, a question from Duncan Exley from Tottenham, um, I think in London. Um, he writes, given that a lot of key workers experience treatment at the hands of employers, the benefit system and landlords that can fairly be described as contemptuous, what are the prospects for people and civil society groups to be able to promote policy platforms that treat these heroes of the pandemic with due respect, with respect to pay and a whole series of other issues right down to housing. So I guess um, the question is, wh where's the potential for, for not just pay, but also more generally respect to be enforced or promoted? So I think it's a really important question. Um, I still have a campaign about kind of respect for shop workers. Um, and one of the things they found, which is just incredibly depressing during the pandemic, is the number of people, retail workers, talking about facing abuse. Um, obviously kind of stressed out customers, basically, people anxious, worried um, about their food and about their health, but taking out that stress on retail staff. And that's clearly not acceptable. And you can look on the Usdor website for their campaign to stop it. But I do think, um, Respect is good, but respect also comes from being paid decently, being able to raise your voice at work um, and having a decent set of rights. And I think we should, you know, like, I, I kind of feel like we should see respect as an outcome, basically, and think about what are the concrete things we can put in place. There were really concrete things we could be putting in place now. We could be raising the minimum wage. We could be banning zero hours contracts. That would be an expression of respect for millions of people um, who work in key worker jobs. Um, we could be giving people the right to meet with a union on their premises or possibly a digital right to access a trade union. And those are concrete changes which would give people more voice and more power at work. And I think that's probably the best way to build respect for um, the key workers and the essential role they've played during the pandemic. We also hey, need to address sorry. The, yeah, please carry on. We need to address the housing crisis as well, because that's where um, a lot of people struggle um, when rents are so high. Um, and uh, um, it was particularly in London, particularly in, in big cities. Um, we're just not really doing anything much about that right now. So thanks. So um, Kate, I might address this to you again. So Zoya, uh, a master's student in human rights and politics here at the LSE, writes that uh, recently I've been following the Justice for Cleaners movement here at the LSE. Like other key workers, cleaner, cleaners at the LSE are underpaid and disproportionately from black and minority ethnic groups. How can students push against this systematically? We've been aiming to increase awareness about this issue, but a university which prides its, which presides itself on incredible research on social inequality is not adequately responding. How can we push for change? Um, well, that's a great start, Zoya. I'm um, raising it here, um, and I commend you on doing so. Um, I'm sure those workers are unionised, um, and you're supporting their unionisation efforts. Like shame can um, basically and making sure that the, whether it's in lectures, whether it's in seminars, whether it's in public events is a really, a really important way of doing that. Um, obviously, there's other um, action which are not really 
possibly interesting kind of innovative union organizing online rallies. I meant to say that earlier, actually, when someone talked about the potential of technology. Um, the National Education Union were telling us earlier today that they had 100,000 people on an online rally. Basically, that's a pretty powerful way to make the case for change. So I think there's a lot of creativity we can use in our campaigning methods. Um, and you've obviously started. Um, so good luck with the rest of it, I would probably say. Thanks very much. So um, back to you, Deborah. Um, Igarim Nurmakarnova from Kazakhstan has the following question. Thank you for the discussion. Do you think this pandemic will also make us reevaluate taxation systems in OECD countries and make us adopt something more progressive? Um, I'm just seeing if that's the end of the question. Yes, it is. That's a usefully concise question as well as being an important one. Hi, Igor. Um, that is, um, that's also a great question. Um, tax is another thing that I have a massive bee in my bonnet about. We have created this weird system where people seem to think that tax is there to be avoided and tax um, is something to um, resist paying and that people hate paying it. Uh, and why have we done that? Why do we not have tax as a badge of a, a decent society? Um, tax is a sign that we um, are paying for our, um, our services, we're paying for um, infrastructure and paying to um, support people when they need it. Uh, tax is a, is a good thing. It's something that we all um, benefit from and we should, we should triumph in that. We should actually say, um, we, we should reveal how much we pay in tax um, like the Scandinavians do. All tax returns in Sweden are published online, um, which I think would be fascinating. Although, of, of course, people really hate the idea whenever you suggest that here. But it's something that um, comes up time and again. We need to we, we need to reward people for paying a lot of tax, not just not just um, assume that the more money you've got, the more tax you will avoid and uh, the more routes around it and um, the um, different taxes um, that people will try and, and wriggle out of, like inheritance tax, which everyone seems to hate. Um, I just think tax is a badge of honour and we should, uh, instead of awarding um, whatever we do, um, honours to people for services to um, business, we should honour people who've paid masses of tax and give them an honour instead. <laughs> Don't you think, Kate? I mean, tax is a badge of... No, I'm, I'm very up for this plan. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's, a, there's an interesting, it's really interesting just to... Right, thanks very much. Have we lost Robin? Oh. <laughs> we Please. Have... Robin, um, we can't hear you, I think. Oh, maybe you're back. Yeah. I was uh, I'm here, but I don't know that you're, you're fully here, maybe. That... Can, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, we didn't hear you for a bit. I was going to go on to say no. that um, I would like to think that we could use um, the pandemic to make an argument for um, for, for for tax to be um, <laughs> to be a, a badge of honour, as I mentioned. Um, but I've made <laughs> I've said this so many times before. Every time there's a crisis, you kind of say, "Oh, let's use this to make <laughs> tax a good thing," and it never happens. Um, so that people are deeply resistant to the idea. Maybe not in Kazakhstan. I don't know. I like uh, I'd like to think not, but I mean, here they certainly are. Well, it's hard to see how the government's going to be able to avoid doing something about tax because there'll be a huge gaping hole. So the question will become what exactly they do. So there will be a tax debate, but what the outcome will be is another question. I'm going to uh, turn to another question. Um, it's from Barbara Ridpath, who works on a project called Just Work for Theos. And uh, perhaps I'll direct it to you, Kate, in the first instance. Based on the reply about technology, should the TUC or other unions create an app for gig workers to help them to organise? So there's lots of um, efforts going on to try and use kind of worker friendly technology, basically. So we invested in something called WorkSmart as a kind of pilot project to see um, 
you know, if it, we could encourage people to join up. And one thing I think the pandemic has done is kind of jolted a lot of unions into kind of upping their use of technology quickly. And yeah, there's a range of kind of tools that are being piloted. Um, some tools, for example, which allow you to kind of log your working conditions and note when something goes wrong. So you've got a kind of better record of them. Um, I think the key thing though is overcoming what Robin talked about is kind of around atomization basically. And maybe kind of organizing in collective power doesn't have to be face to face, but it probably at some point needs some people to be in a room and able to have a discussion about how they want to, how they want to organize, what their priorities are, what action they're prepared to take to fight for them. And so I think that technology can be a great gateway into um, into those discussions um, and a great way of reaching people out and finding them. Um, we've seen, you know, WhatsApp being used a lot as an organising tool but groups um, just ways of it's not really a trade union unless it's got that collective element basically whereby people come together collectively agree their priorities and collectively agree what to do about them so those kind of technological hacks need to lead the discussion is is my view thanks let me turn now to a question from rodney gritton who asks about the media. Um, perhaps, Deborah, you might start as you have a back history in the media, um, though perhaps not the media that Rodney has in mind. Can the red top media be pressed to follow the revelations by the Financial Times and speak for the interests of those in the red wall constituencies, whose interests are really pursued by the red top owners and their journalists? Um, yes, yeah, so that, um... That whole story in the in the FT about um, the government having a, a hidden agenda to cut workers' rights as a result of Brexit. Um, uh, Ed Miliband was also writing about that in the Guardian at the weekend. Um, of course, we've seen um, the Daily Mirror does um, speak up for workers' rights, um, but um, so much of the press tends to be um, very, um, very much. Um, on the side of, of um, the government and uh, and in um, in in thrall to this idea of Brexit um, and the whole propaganda idea that they um, the Tories have managed to foist on us about scroungers versus strivers and all that um, nonsense that um, that um, we had under the coalition government. Um, I think, uh, interestingly, um, the Daily Mail, um, I think, is an interesting one here because it has slightly changed its tune um, over um, rampant capitalism. I think it does, it does have um, this idea that people are being unfairly treated, particularly on wages. And uh, it is very much against these huge pay differentials that I mentioned um, in my in my talk, um, and I think uh, it, its new editor is, has got slightly different agenda from the previous one. Um, and I think uh, you know it could be um, it, it can it can be um, a um, more progressive voice on um, incomes. Um, I won't say on everything, but because it's plainly not, but I do think that there is a slight change of tone there. I think it's gonna be hard to win over some of the others, um, uh, particularly um, the, uh, the Rupert Murdoch papers, but um, well, a few triumphs, you know. <laughs> we <laughs> need to make uh, you know progress where you can. Okay, thank you. So um, here's another question um, from Dorothea Bultrux, a uh, social policy alumni in London. Um, she asked, perhaps I'll just ask you again in the first instance, Deborah, because we lost Kate there for a minute. Has any country introduced a maximum pay or maximum pay ratio or similar policy instruments? And how would you respond to the inevitable criticism that it would drive investors and firms to move abroad? Um, yeah, so that's a very interesting um, one. Um, so what um, we see um, quite a lot as justification for huge payout, payouts to the top um, is the um, 
this idea that um, chief execs or, or these highly talented people who run companies will just leave and up sticks and go and uh, set up elsewhere. Or we, we always get this idea that people will move, move to the US because that's where they pay the most. But when you actually look at the figures, that's very, very seldom happens. Um, the US very seldom recruits um, top bosses from overseas. It might recruit people lower down the, the ladder and train them up and then promote them, but they rarely come from um, the UK, for example, and pitch into the US as a, as a chief executive. So, so this idea of the sort of international marketplace for talent um, is a bit of a misleading one. Um, there have been discussions in some countries about um, pay ratios. Um, there has been no, as far as I know, no maximum wage introduced, um, which, which is quite a hard one to get around. Um, interestingly, Bill Clinton raised this idea um, as far back as um, 1991. Um, he actually suggested um, that there should be no tax deductions for companies that paid their bosses more than a million dollars. Um, well, I mean, you can imagine how that went down um, and uh, was absolutely a non-starter. Um, and, uh, and now um, the average pay for top bosses in the US is, is more like $10 million. So, um, you know, so it didn't happen. It's, 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 it comes up sometimes in discussions, um, but um, is rarely um, forced through. Um, the Scandinavian countries have probably got the lowest um, pay distribution um, in private companies, but that um, is largely down to very strong union and actually collective bargaining, bargaining across industries. Um, so they still have the old, um, I mean, we used to do this in the UK, didn't we? But we don't know. <laughs> um, they still have sectoral bargaining. Um, so they set pay, they set wage um, policies for whole industries. Um, and that's, you know, that seems to work well. Um, but yeah, we've not, we've not seen um, a, um, a wage, um, a pay ratio introduced on a countrywide basis. And um, European countries have tended, I mean, the, the pay um, in continental Europe did tend to be a lot um, Chief executive pay was a lot lower, um, but it has been creeping up again, um, driven by um, the US, um, which always leads the way on these things. Great, thanks very much. So, uh, Kate, a question from Vanishwa, who's at University College London. Um, Vanishwa says that you highlighted the fact that a large proportion of key workers are women. Is there any significant evidence of the presence of a gender pay gap among the under this co among this cohort of key workers in the UK? Um, I think it will depend on the occupation, basically. And one of the re one of the things about a lot of these occupations, the honest answer is I haven't got the stats in front of me. I will just say that clearly. So, but I think my understanding of it is is um, because a lot of these occupations are female dominated. They are kind of majority low pay occupations. If you look at care workers and retail workers, the fact that they're female dominated pushes down their pay. But that means when men do work there, they tend to kind of be as low paid as the, as the women rather than um, there being a significant gender pay gap within the occupation. So I think this is kind of gender pay driven by occupational segregation, but that will obviously be really different um, in the various key worker occupations. So probably different from retail workers, from care workers, different for care workers, for postal workers, different for postal workers, from delivery drivers even. Um, so that's a long way of saying, I will go away and look at, look at the actual stats on the gender pay gap. And there is a briefing on key workers on the TEC website where I'm trying to remember if we looked at that. But I think this is more a case of occupational segregation than gender pay gaps within, within occupations. Okay, um, so here's a here's a question from Joe Briel, a child and child and family student, social worker, and an LSC alumni um, in the political sociology program. I might add, 
Um, and perhaps first to you, Deborah, but also also you, Kate. Um, so Joe asks, have the political coalitions which are necessary to deliver a political party willing to re-establish union powers and fundamentally challenge income inequality been irreparably damaged by the cultural wars and the populist turn? So perhaps if you've got any thoughts, Deborah, and then Kate. That is, that's a really interesting one. Um, yeah, I don't know is the answer to that. I really don't know. I do think that the culture wars are just difficult, um, a whole other minefield. Um, I do think that we have, um, uh, we, m I'm very much in favor of a progressive coalition. Um, I know um, it's, it's a bit of a divisive view, but um, this idea that you would um, stand down candidates in constituencies where um, a joint vote for say Lib Dem and Greens and Labour would be more than the um, conservative um, uh, majority. So it would be enough to push people um, in progressives into, um, into power. Um, I know that Labour is, has been very resistant to this, but I just don't see how they will be able to build um, a sufficient majority um, given the challenge that they now face um, with the, um, the whole fallout um, in the Red Wall and those other areas. Um, so I would like to see that happen um, in terms of um, political, co political coalitions. Um, I would like to think we can still build them, but I do think, yes, culture wars have really undermined things. Um, my, another thing I'd like to say, actually, sorry, it's not on that subject, but this whole kind of post-fact environment that we now live in, which I think has really, um, where you look at what's going on in the US at the moment, and you can just, it's absolutely terrifying, this idea that people exist in different universes and believe different sets of facts or different sets of, of, of that just believe different things um, and don't actually, there is no truth anymore. As a former journalist, I find it absolutely terrifying. Um, and, and I just don't know how, how we address that. I mean, really it is, you know, we've, we've all got to try and address that. So, so Kate, the same question really, but I mean, the questioner was asking, especially about the capacity to re-strengthen collective bargaining and trade union organisation. So not, not just a political coalition that could win an election, but with that objective in mind. Um, so I'm not a political strategist, so, you know, I don't really know, but two kind of observations, I guess. One is that the kind of, culture wars and kind of political fractures that we're seeing are I think you know only tackled by greater collectivism and we know that collective bargaining is you know and collective organization is a way to unite concerns about racial justice and economic justice we know for example black workers more likely to be in insecure work and we know for example the work trade unions around the world have been doing combating the far right and kind of fighting back against attempts to make us talk about cultural issues rather than economic issues by showing that you know the struggles are interconnected I guess the other thing I would say is that we have had governments election, elected in kind of liberal countries promising to bring back collective bargaining. So I gave you the quote from Joe Biden, you know, the US is one of the countries with the lowest kind of trade union membership in the world, one in which the problems Deborah are talking about have been most kind of chronic. Um, and yet extremely strong statements about the importance of trade unions and collective bargaining. And he's been elected and now he has, you know, almost a Senate, not quite a Senate majority, but he is able to govern. Um, if we take New Zealand, also, uh, you know, a country which has um, suffered or kind of experienced a long kind of period of liberal, for want of a better word, kind of government, um, Again, Jacinda Ardern's government have brought in new structures to promote collective bargaining. They've brought in forms of collective bargaining across sectors in the way that Deborah Hargraves talked about. Um, I think they're called um, fair wage boards, basically, but have actually recognised that kind of collective power is going to be one of the things they need to deliver fairness. So I am known amongst, you know, colleagues, friends, everyone for being an over optimist. But I think these are like real concrete signs that actually in some 
you know, what you might have thought of as some pretty unpromising um, environments for the advance of kind of collective power and organisation, you have seen steps forward. Thank you. I think we're coming um, cl close to the end. I'm, I'm going to ask um, one other question here from Jacob Zhao, uh, who's a, a BSc student here at the LSE. And uh, Jacob says that as unionism can be protectionist and conservative, is established unionism within the current national framework going to be able to address the problems of flexible exploitation at home offices that have emerged in the COVID-19 pandemic? And Jacob goes on to raise the question of the outsourcing of white collar work uh, to different countries and asks, would an alternative radical internationalist union, unionism be able to address this problem? So I think I'll just ask you both again. Um, perhaps, Kate, if you want to start, it's uh, on the unionism topic principally. Um, well, I think every one of our um, member trade unions would describe themselves as radical and internationalist, basically, and would not restrict that. You know, we could debate those definitions for a long time. Movement are deeply committed to the principles of internationalism and solidarity and have been focusing on how we can strengthen those. Um, and, you know, of course, I'd be really happy to talk about that kind of at greater length. Um, I think how we strengthen those um, during the pandemic. Um, again, there's some interesting kind of, maybe not opportunities, but one of the other things that um, uh, has been exposed by um, the pandemic is the conditions of people working in global supply chains, basically. You might have seen kind of Bangladeshi garment workers being left without any work, basically, at a point when kind of Western brands were unable to open, stop selling clothes and just remove the work. And some of the things that trade unions um, and trade union centres like the TC have been organising and pushing for for a long time, like greater responsibility along global supply chains, um, kind of mandatory due diligence of supply chains to check human and workers' rights um, and to enable the right to organise um, in some of those places. You know, the need for those changes has never been clearer. And those are changes that are internationalist and they stop the race to the bottom. Um, I think there are real challenges about... Um, how you do trade unionism when lots of people are working at home, basically. You know, we talk about workplace organising um, and what if your workplace is your bedroom or, you know, your sitting room or wherever it might be. I think um, some of the things, you know, that is where we need to be creative about digital tools. We'd already been calling for a kind of digital right of access, which would mean the right for a trade union to contact workers through whatever kind of the employer's communication channels to tell them about the benefits of joining a trade union. And I think we're going to have to think a lot more and a lot harder about that um, in the months and years to come. Yes. So, Deborah, on this internationalism point, I guess. Um, so I just, I, I don't think I can add to what Kate said about unions and collective bargaining, but I would also say that we as consumers have huge amount of power as well. I mean, we have the power um, of our... Um, of our patronage, obviously. So we can um, shun companies that we know are um, exploiting workers or um, not paying tax or, you know, doing other things in, in, in the world, in the global economy that um, we disapprove of. And, and I mean, um, Starbucks a couple of years ago was um, shamed into paying um, a one-off tax um, uh, bill in the UK after um, consumer calls for a boycott. Um, so it does work. Um, not, uh, I mean, it doesn't actually mean Starbucks said it would pay tax every year, but <laughs> at least it was something. <laughs> and, and perhaps just tack one last thing on a, a, a thought from another question. A Dr. Arif from Yemen asks, do you think international labour standards need to be revised, especially to meet the COVID-19 situation? And how would that be mainstreamed? Sorry, Deborah. Um, again, yeah. been... No, Kate, you go ahead, please. I mean, we have been talking about the need for kind of mandatory um, human rights due diligence uh, on global right. supply chains, and that's maybe where we'd start in terms of making sure that, you know, kind of the economic employers, those who have the economic power are actually making sure that those who produce their value for them are treated decently and fairly. 
yeah, I really think that's important um, is to um, is, is to make sure that people are at least uh, um, employers are at least meeting current labor standards um, uh, as well as um, improving them in future. Listen, thank you both very much. I mean, it's a it's a huge and complicated topic and you can see strands of the analysis that pull in both directions. I mean, on the one hand, there's the sort of potential for optimism that a crisis can generate, possibly something along the lines of the Second World War or other great crises. On the other hand, there's sort of bits of evidence of a kind of neo-Victorianism almost with, with certain people living in one sort of life and other people living in a completely other service sector life. I mean, the word service sector has come to mean something very particular in our world, but once upon a time, it meant something quite clear. It was sort of an upstairs, downstairs situation. There's some evidence of that as well. So it's a very, it's a very mixed picture. But I think if I was to summarise um, the talks, uh, what came through strongly was that there was some sense of hope and optimism for all the pessimism. So Deborah Hargreaves started by telling us that Britain was indeed world beating, world beating in income inequality, and yet she thought at the end of the day that there were solutions available, putting more workers on pay remuneration committees or on company boards um, and the creative use of the data about ratios and used examples from the world that we all inhabit, uh, like John Lewis, to show how this might function. And Kate Bell similarly emphasised various sources of hope, the retreat from the arguments of austerity and a rowing back from claims about deregulation, all of which combined with a somewhat greater re-recognition of the importance, the vital importance of collective bargaining and trade union organisation, create the institutional basis for some hope. So listen, thank you both very much indeed for contributing to our series and thank you to the audience for the questions. And we we'll look forward to seeing you all at our next 